All right. Can, can people see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, this is not going to be a very long talk because there is there are not too many theorems involved here. But uh, I just wanted to run through this particular conjecture, which has been open for a very long time. And, you know, sporadically there are improvements, but not, uh, you know, it is nowhere near a solution in any sense. So it's called Berger's conjecture. And I want to uh, relate it to a, a conjecture of mine, which I think, I mean, I'm sure uh, Yerabino will probably by the end of the lecture will say, no, I'm, I'm talking completely not complete nonsense, but being an expert on Hilbert's scheme, but let me anyway, start this talk. All right, so, so the, let me fix some notation. The, the, the things can be much more general than what I say, but I don't want to keep uh, bringing back, uh, you know, oh, I have to put this condition, that condition. So I'll just stick to the most important case of the conjecture. So, <clears throat> so P or sometimes PN will denote power series and N variables over, over complex numbers and, um, and uh, all the rings we will consider are of the form quotients of this power series ring, unless otherwise mentioned, okay? Uh, for such a ring <coughs> A, omega one A as usual will denote the module of finite differentials, uh, finite differentials because power series ring, if you take arbitrary differentials, it's too big. So usually, we we will want to deal with finite differentials, which means we always have an exact sequence. So the, the omega one of uh, power series ring and n variable will be generated as a module by freely by dx1, dx2, dx and the differential. So you have a natural exact sequence, okay? And, uh, for a, and of course, for a finite length module m, we will write lm to denote its length. Uh, notice that in our case, it is just a vector space dimension over the over the complex numbers. Good. So those are the basic notations. So I will use them consistently. All right. So the, let me state the conjecture. The, so B Berger conjectured in 1963 the following. Let, <clears throat> so it, as you can see, it is a pretty old conjecture and uh, it's still nowhere near a, a complete solution of any kind. So let A be a one-dimensional domain, assume omega one is uh, torsion free, then A is actually regular. That is A is actually using one variable. So, so that's the, uh, my internet connection is unstable, all right. Then, <clears throat> So, so there has been a lot of work done towards the conjecture. A complete solution has still eluded us. In this talk, I will set a new optimistic conjecture on Hilbert's scheme of points, which will imply Berger's conjecture. That is my basic plan. Very good. <clears throat> so, so again, I will not talk about all the work that has been done previously on this, uh, because some of them are you know, technical, and the technical things are on, in a lecture, it invariably gets, uh, you know, it just clouds one's mind. So I will only say very uh, known results, which are very general than uh, uh, other things. So that's my uh, kind of excuse here to say only rather simple, simple things and not very technical things. Okay, <clears throat> so, so this is related to another closely related conjecture. Uh, called the rigidity conjecture, which too is open, okay? So let A be, a, in this case, let A be a one-dimensional domain as before. If the X1 of A omega one A comma A is zero, then A is regular. So the previous statement said that the omega one A is torsion free, then A is regular. This one says that if the X1 is zero, then A is regular. So that's a rigidity conjecture. And why is it called rigidity conjecture? Because the X group, as you probably know, is the tangent space to deformations of A. So if you want to deform A and you want to look at what the tangent space is, this X1 is precisely the tangent space, uh, infinitesimal tangent space. 
uh, deformations. And so the conjecture says that if A has no non-trivial deformation, and that is why A is rigid, then A is regular. So, so that is the basic thing. Very good. And a closely related, kind of, the, 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 the notice that if A is Gorenstein, if I take Gorenstein uh, rings, then these two statements are equal, right? If A is, if A is for example, if A is Gorenstein, what does X1 omega 1A, a, comma A is zero? Remember A is a one dimensional domain. So X1 is zero is same as saying omega 1 is torsion free. So if A is Gorenstein, this condition says omega 1A is torsion free. So Berger's conjecture comes into play. And vice versa, if uh, omega 1 is torsion free and A is Gorenstein, then X1 is zero. So these two conjectures are equivalent for the Gorenstein case. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the first uh, obvious result that all of you have already guessed is the easy case of the conjecture. That is, if A is a one dimensional domain, which is a, a complete intersection, then the conjecture is actually true. Yeah. And this is, I'm sure all of you know how to do this, but let me go through this. In this case, what happens to our exact sequence for the omega one? The only difference is now because it's a complete intersection and A is a domain, this uh, I mod I square to A dx, that map that we discussed earlier, becomes injection on the left-hand side because uh, I mod I square is a free mod. Sorry? Oops, oops, sorry, something else. Yeah. No, nothing. You're okay? Yeah. So I mod I square to the, the left-hand side uh, map becomes an inclusion because I mod I square is free and this map, the D map is generically injective and therefore actually injective because a free module to free module. And then of course that says, the exact sequence says omega one A uh, has projected dimension at most one because I mod I square is a free module. Dirac sum A DXI of course is a free module. So omega one A has projected dimension at most one. But now there is a famous result of Auslander Bookswam uh, which say the projected dimension of omega one a must be actually zero because remember the Auslander books bomb theorem says if you have a module of finite projected dimension, then projected dimension plus depth equal to depth of the ring. In this case, depth of the module is uh, one because we are assuming omega one a is torsion free. Depth of the ring is of course one; it's a one-dimensional domain, and therefore projected dimension must be zero. And projected dimension is zero means omega one is free and therefore uh, A must be regular, yeah? So that's, I expect it to generalize to higher dimension and it does. So let's look at the first easy case. So let dimension of A equal to D, a complete intersection ring, and assume that omega one is cohen macaulay then A is regular. The argument is exactly the same. The previous statement says, you have an exact sequence I mod I square to a free module to omega one to zero, so projected dimension must be finite, is actually less than or equal to one, but uh, cohen macaulay ness of omega one A will say omega one A must be free, and that says it's fine. But of course, this is not that interesting because it is not as strong as our earlier statement. So that's also another statement which comes up, which is known due to uh, Arapura in the global case, and Hubel in the local case. So, so what is, uh, so Arapura proved it this first, well, in the, in the global case by saying that if we have a family of uh, varieties, uh, all uh, the this general member smooth, and the special member is cohen macaulay then you only need to know whether the top differential form is torsion free, exactly like in the case. In the curve case, there is only one, and the top differential form is the first differential forms. So, so, so let me say that again. Uh, so again, now dimension is equal to D, but now we assume the ring is cohen macaulay Then further assume that A can be deformed to a smooth ring. That's an extra hypothesis, namely general, you can find a deformation of my ring A, which can be, uh, so the general member is smooth. Then if you had the D, the top differential forms, omega DA, which is the, D the exterior of omega of an A is torsion free, then A is regular. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very nice 
uh, result in general of course everything any if you drop any of these assumptions you can easily counter, counter examples to regularity of the ring so it's a very beautiful theorem yeah so another case known is when a is positively graded and that is due to gunther shea and now there are several proofs so so let me state that again if a is a positively graded one dimensional domain with omega one a torsion free then A is regular. Are there, are there any questions that people have? No. I think no. <laughs> Not okay. yet. Okay. <clears throat> Please do stop whenever you have questions. Okay. So, so I will, to prove this, I mean, I said that there are many proofs, Gunther shares proof slightly different, but let me state an easy lemma. This is the trivial lemma, namely, I look at a very special case of a ring, namely, remember P was the P was a power series ring in n variables, and I go modulo the maximal ideal raised to some power d, so where m is the maximal ideal. Then I then this is an Artin local ring, and I want to calculate the omega one of that, and you can calculate omega one because the exact you can write the exact sequence as the Euler sequence very beautifully, and I will not do it here, but it's clear that. If you write the exact sequence, then you will get an obvious vector space dimension count, give you the uh -oh, uh, length of omega one of A is equal to D minus one. D is the power that I'm taking the maximal ideal times N plus D minus one choose D. Yeah. It's a clear, easy statement. Okay, so why is this important? So let's, so let, let me give a proof of Shaya's result because it is easy and, and this will, Keep replaying this game, okay? So if A as in the proposition, A is graded means I can write A as A naught direct sum A1 plus blah, 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 with A naught equal to the complex and the constants are C and then everything else. Huh? So now one has the, the advantage of a graded thing is you always have the so-called Euler derivation from A to A. That is, if I take any element, you write in terms of its homogeneous component, sigma AI, then you multiply the ith component by i. Okay, that that is near. You can easily check that this is a derivation from a. Yeah, it's a very simple, nice uh, derivation, Euler derivation, and whose image is just the maximal ideal. So d a to a, of course, the constants go to zero, but everything else go to except something gets multiplied, but otherwise over complex numbers, uh, multiplication by some positive number makes no real difference in terms of the image. So the, the maximum idea. Thus, we have uh, differential form sales. We have a map from omega 1a to n, which, which is surjective. But once it is surjective, since omega 1a is torsion free, this must be an isomorphism. Remember, omega 1a is a uh, rank one sheaf, rank one module. Therefore, uh, so that's really the main point of uh, uh, the gradedness. Namely, if you grade it, you get, and with the uh, hypothesis of omega 1 on torsion, -free, you get an isomorphism between omega 1 and a and n. Okay, then we can calculate using this isomorphism, we can calculate omega 1 of a mod m square. Uh, remember a mod m square is, I can assume uh, a was p mod i, where I, I can always assume i is contained in m square. So going model of this, you just get a mod m square. And then you get a standard exact sequence and you look at the exact sequence. And then this shows that omega 1 of a mod m square by this exact, remember image of M square under the D map is just M, as I said earlier. So, so the co-kernel omega one M mod M square is just M mod M square. So the differential forms is just M mod M square. But then I look at my above lemma, one, one, one knows length of omega one M mod M square, which is just, if I put in the previous lemma here, in this case, I'm taking D equal to two, when you take d equal to 2 and you look at the uh, number here, you just get n plus 1 choose 2, where n is the embedding dimension. Yeah. So on the other hand, 
omega 1 m r m square, we just checked with m r m square, whose length is precisely n, which is just the embedding dimension. So I get n is equal to n plus one choose two, which implies n equal to one, which is what I wanted to prove. Embedding dimension is actually one. Yeah, so it's a completely elementary proof. Okay. There is another interesting conjecture called the Artinian Berger conjecture, suggested by Guillermo Cortinas and Chuck Weibel, uh, which let me state it. So, so again, <clears throat> in this case, it's completely the, it's a it's a statement about Artin rings. So, so let A contained in B be Artin local rings and assume that B is isomorphic to C power series x mod x raised to R, uh, the simplest possible kind of Artin local rings. If, if the natural map omega 1a to omega 1b is injective, then A is isomorphic to C power series x mod x raised to S. So, so the, the B is a nice looking ring, then and omega 1a to omega 1b is injective, which is a very strong condition, then A is isomorphic to that. It's a very uh, interesting conjecture. Not uh, much is known about it. Okay, so okay, why does oh, this conjecture imply burgers? I have a question. Let us understand that. Yeah, yeah. The question yeah. is, at do, do, how about it little globally, like over a DVR? Is it, we have to go to completion here? It's is it uh, false? There are various various. No, no. It, the, the, the completion is only for avoiding unnecessary discussions of various conditions to be put in. For example, if I want to work with the characteristic P. There are, mm -hmm. there are things statement made. You know, the field has to be perfect, that, that, blah, blah. And certain statements about whether, uh, you know, the, the rings are reasonably good so that when you go to completion, what happens? That sort of stuff too, you know. So, there, no, no, there are many variations, except I don't want to, each time I have to put in, I have to keep saying, oh, this happens or that happens, you know. Okay. So, whereas in the completion case, there is nothing to worry about, but but uh, but otherwise you have to do a few things, yeah. But nothing, no, not no. Most of the what you expect to be true will be true. In other words, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so why why does this conjecture imply Berger's conjecture? So take R to be a, as usual a one-dimensional domain with omega one R torsion free. Yeah? That's our starting point for Berger. And now take SP the normalization so that see, here is a case where that happened, right? If I took R to be an arbitrary uh, ring, let's say uh, a fine ring, uh, a one dimensional domain, uh, then the normalization may not look like C powers uh, polynomial ring in one variable. Normalization will be a dedicate domain, but, uh, but not, and sometimes not even depending on the situation. Uh, so there are cases where normalization will not even be uh, a domain, right? We know that, right? You know, like nodal case, nodal curve. When you take a, in the completion level, take a normalization, suddenly things become bad. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that if it if it is a, a, a completion level, then the normalization is always power series three. Otherwise, you have to be a little more careful as to what S looks like. <coughs> anyway. So take uh, the normalization. So that is some power series ring in one variable. So now we can take an ideal i in R such that i times s is equal to i, right? That's the main point. So what, what kind of ideals will do this trip? Uh, you can, for example, you can take the conductor ideal, that's the standard ideal, so-called conductor ideal, which is uh, uh, an ideal in R as well as an ideal in S. That is basically saying that when I, pull it up to the, uh, take the ideal in R and pull it up to S, this, um, it continues to be the same thing. No other extra elements get added to the conductor ideal. Yeah, but I, therefore I can take, in fact, any multiple of the conductor ideal, any ideal, conductor ideal times any other ideal will do the same trick. Uh, so in particular, some large power. <clears throat> yeah, I, mean, I just want I to be, the ideal I'm going to take to be inside the maximum ideal square. So I as well take a large power. Mm -hmm. So I take such a large power idea, conduct, uh, power of the conductor ideal. Then one can check. Once you do that, you take A to be R mod I in this conjecture situation. A, A, 
A is going to be R mod I, B, and then you can check. So the only thing I have to check, of course, S mod I is by definition, S remember is C power series X. So S mod I is or S mod I, these are the form C power series X mod low some power of the X because you know, the, it's a PI. Uh, but the only thing I check, and it is easy to check in this particular case, that the condition of ABC hold, namely omega 1A to omega 1B is in fact injected. Okay, that's the main point. Okay, and that says uh, by, by uh, if ABC conjecture is true, that says A itself is uh, C power series X mod X raised to N, that is A has embedding dimension one. But if A has embedding dimension one, remember I was chosen to be some large power, so embedding dimension of A is same as embedding dimension of R, therefore R has embedding dimension one, which is same as saying R is a power series. Very good, so that's very easy. Hmm? And they, they use this to prove a few cases of <coughs> uh, Berger's conjecture. I will not go into it because the, you know, it, uh, if, if multiplicity is such and such, et cetera, et cetera, or embedding dimension is small, they try to prove various things. But I will not uh, get into it because those numbers, you and I will listen to a lecture and next day we will forget. So might as well continue. Okay, now I come to my main point. As I said, my lecture is going to be short. So, so here is Hilbert's scheme. So for de again, for definiteness sake, let me uh, take Hilbert's scheme, which I denote by H n comma D, two numbers N and D denote the Hilbert scheme of art and local rings <coughs> of, uh, of, of the form A equal to P n uh, mod I, P n n is the number of, Variables remember in the art and local in the in the power series ring, and uh, I is some ideal, and uh, length of A is the number D, and I is contained in the square of the maximal ideal, which is a harmless assumption to make because if I is contained in not contained in the square of the maximal ideal, I can do, drop one of the variables and think of my A as something in H n minus one D, right? And so might as well assume that I is always contained in the square of the maximal ideal. And so here is my definition for uh, uh, the thing I want to talk about. Since I couldn't think of a better word, I will just call a ring, a local ring of the above kind to be good. If the uh, derivation map D, A to omega, the universal derivation from A to omega 1A has kernel precisely C. The constants, of course, always go to zero, but nothing else goes to zero under the map D. Yeah. So that's good. And my conjecture is the set of all good A in H and D is dense. So this is this is my main not enough evidence exists in any sense, but um, but it, so at least it's a clean statement to make. And as I, I, and of course, um, you know, people who have worked in Hilbert's scheme of points will tell you, especially Tony will tell me, Tony had come and talked to me about this 25 years ago in uh, St. Louis about, you know, we discussed all these things when we were here. Um, anyway, so, so it is um, almost everything that can go wrong, can go wrong in a Hilbert scheme of points, huh? punctual Hilbert. So, so it's a, it's a terrible object to look at. And there are very, very few uh, positive statements about Hilbert schemes. Uh, and so I'm hoping that this is not too serious a statement and therefore might be true. Anyway, so that's, that's where I'm looking at. Okay, let's continue. <clears throat> so that's my conjecture. Okay, so you, you look at all the po uh, points in H and D, uh, which are good. That means the derivation has only constants as kernel, then <coughs> it is dense. Okay, so the first question that should come to mind <coughs> after the above conjecture is, are there any A which is not good? If all the A's are good, like in the case of, if you think of, think of uh, one-dimensional domains, right, we have saw. The, the universal derivation A to omega 1A, the only kernel is precisely the constants, nothing else. No, no uh, non-trivial function will go to zero under the derivation map. 
So in the art and local ring, what is different? That's what I want to understand first. So are there any A which is not good? Uh, this brings us to a beautiful result of Brian Kahn's coda, originally proved by analytic methods and later proved algebraically by Lippmann and Sate. Okay, so let's look at that. So, so take up uh, power series F in Pn with no, con no constant term. The question asked, being asked is, is the Brian Kahn's coda asked is, is F itself belongs to the ideal generated by the partial derivative, fx1, fx2, etc. fx1. And the brilliant answer by Brian Conscorda is, they don't know whether f is in here, but they do know f raised to n is always there. Huh? Remember, the n is same as the number of variables. So if I take an arbitrary power series with, with no constant term, take its derivative, the ideal generated by that, then the nth power is always there. Yeah, it's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful theorem, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so, so given this, then I know that f raised to n always belongs, but does f itself belong? That's the next. <clears throat> is it possible that f is not itself not in the ideal? Huh? If f is a homogeneous polynomial, this is where the whole game starts. And homogeneous polynomial, this is a correct statement, f belongs, because that's the famous Euler's identity. Euler's identity says I can write f as a linear combination of fx1, etc., fx, and if it f is homogeneous. But, um, but uh, it is the, the first example to my knowledge was uh, example, I, I, as I said, I'm ashamed to say because I don't remember the author's name, uh, was uh, given by somebody the, the following, namely take two variable polynomial, of course, and one variable Nothing to say because uh, we know exactly everything. So take P2 to be power series in two variable and take this particular polynomial, uh, polynomial F, x square, y square plus x5 plus y5. Then one checks that F is not actually in Fx, F5. And Brian Conscorda will say F square is in Fx, comma F, the ideal generated by Fx and F5. So why is this important for our case? Now, so here is an A. So in the above example, one can also check that fxfy is a regular sequence. And thus, that's not a local ring. And the image of f is not zero because f is not in fxfy. But under the natural map d, a to omega 1a, <coughs> clearly df is zero because df is, right? Derivative is dff is fx times something plus fy times something, both are zero in my a. So, so that's a, one of the simpler, simple example of an art and local ring, which is not good. So as a remark, I want to say all positively guided rings are good because of oil derivation. And uh, uh, that's one thing. And similarly, given A, given any element in the Hilbert scheme, you can always deform, right? After all, you can essentially deform any its, uh, its associated graded ring in the Hilbert scheme itself. So, so you can always deform it so that uh, you have a family of, let's say, one parameter family of uh, art and local rings with the when I put a one equal, I get a, and then I put t equal to zero, I get the graded the, the associated graded ring. So you can always deform something to a good guy. In other words, a family of given any art and local ring, there is a family of art and local rings so that the special member is good. But unfortunately, that doesn't say anything about my conjecture. We are interested in quote unquote in some sense the general member than the special member. Okay. <clears throat> okay, now I want to illustrate why the, my conjecture implies Berger's conjecture. Yeah, so we start with an easy lemma. Uh, take, uh, again, as before, one dimensional domain, omega one is torsion free. And then for a general choice of the variable x equal to xi, we have the length of omega one of a mod xa. Remember, this is an art and local ring. When I go modulo x, 
it is strictly less than length of A mod X. Yeah, that's a lemma. Okay, what is the proof? Proof is straightforward. Take such a general X in the maximal ideal, but not in the square of the maximum ideal. Then I have the inclusion C power series X contained in A. This is the finite because but we are in complete case, everything is finite. And thus we have an exact sequence uh, using this thing, zero A times DX goes to omega one of A to omega one of A, the relative differentials A over CX. And now you go modulo X, namely tensor this with A mod XA to get this exact sequence, A mod XA DX, omega one A mod X, omega one A, and this co-kernel becomes, now you take uh, your 10, uh, related differentials becomes omega one of a over x a. Okay, so so when what is the advantage of a torsion free model? You have a omega one a is torsion free, and rank one. Therefore, when I go model a non-zero divisor, the the length of that is same as length of the corresponding ring. So length of omega one a mod x times omega one a is same as length of a mod x a. Here is where I've used. Uh, torsion freeness of omega 1a. Hmm? And this map is non zero because x is not, dx is not in the max, uh, x is not in the max uh, square of the maximal ideal. So dx will go to a non zero element in the first term. So what does it say? This has length, a, the middle term has length a mod xa. And there is, to get the right hand side term, I'm going modulo at least one non zero guy. So this length must be strictly less than length of a mod xa. That's a lemma. All right. No, I put an exclamation mark instead of a one. Okay. Very good. So, so now, so now in our situation, so we the the lemma is proved. So <coughs> now we, we look at <coughs> our a. Now let's look at b equal to a mod x a in our situation. So that we have length of omega one b strictly less than length of b. Now B is of course in H and D for some suitable N and D. <coughs> Since the dense C in H and D we have length of omega one C is bigger than or equal to D minus one, right? Because uh, the, remember uh, so anything which is good means you have a map from uh, omega one A, uh, omega one of C in this case mapping onto the maximal ideal, maximal ideal as dimension equal to D minus one of a, of, because we are assuming dimension of C is D. So length of omega one C better be better than equal to D minus one. Okay. But the, but this one says the first inequality here says A itself has length of omega one B less than length of B, which is D. So length of omega one B is less than or equal to D minus one. So on the one hand, a dense thing has length at length less than d less than or equal to d minus one so you put them together by semi-continuity that length of omega one b better be d minus one it cannot be too small and the next lemma finishes the proof let a be an outer local ring then length of omega one a is bigger than or equal to length a minus one and equality if and only if a is isomorphic to c z if you have proved this then i have proved that my b here is actually isomorphic to CZ mod Z raised to D and then the rest I will, it's easy. So that's really where the idea comes. <clears throat> so let me try to prove this lemma, which is very easy to. Uh, so uh, by our <clears throat> density statement, we have seen that length omega one is less, bigger than the length of omega A minus one. So I assume equality holds, A is in H and D. Then by semi-continuity, a general B in H and D must also satisfy this equality. B from MB to omega 1B injective, where MB is the maximum. Remember, good means MB to um, uh, because of the, uh, the, the, the map from A to uh, A, D map has kernel only constants. So M, the maximum ideal must inject into omega 1. Okay. But, and thus this map is an isomorphism. Then we have seen earlier that the embedding dimension n equal to one, which says a is isomorphic to cz mod z raised to d. Yeah, and so that's a trivial uh, conclusion once I have the, my conjecture is true. Okay, all right. I think I have five more minutes. 
So we are trying to decide whether an art and local ring, so the final remarks, we are trying to decide whether an art and local ring A is isomorphic to something like CZ mod Z raised to D given some information of omega one A. If so, we know like the omega one A equal to D minus one. So the question is about the converse. It is not difficult to see inductively, we may get L omega one, length of omega one A is always bigger than equal length of A minus one for any art and local ring. So we have two parts to the question. And the two parts are, uh, assume L of omega one A is equal to length of A minus one. First, can we deform A so that the general member is isomorphic to that? And that's, it ha this happened easily by my, if, my, if my conjecture is true because general member will have this property. Secondly, if we can, if we can, can we say A itself is of this form? My, my conjecture can, does both, but my conjecture, as I said, I, I don't know the answer to my conjecture, but at least what can I say? <clears throat> so at least for the second question, one has the positive answer. If we further assume A is Gorenstein, huh? that's one place where I can I have an answer. Namely, <clears throat> if I have a, this says if I have a family of art and local rings, uh, so that the general member is of the form CZ mod C raised to D, even with, without my conjecture being true. Assume I have a family of art and local rings and the general member is of the form CZ mod Z raised to D and my special member is Gordenstein and length of omega one A is length of A minus one. So three conditions, right? Length, the, the, it deforms to something nice, length is correct, and it is Gorenstein. No? That's an extra hypothesis, which we don't want to assume ultimately. Uh, then I can show that, uh, in fact, A itself is of the form CZ mod Z raised to D. Okay, so that's, I think that's basically where I want to stop. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh,